It's five o'clock Pacific time on Saturday, uh, May. I think it's the eighth. What's it? What the hell is the date today? Uh, May, May seventh, May seventh. <laughs> Thanks for everyone tuning in. A hey, uh, too slow drinking. Uh, Glenn Alecki, um bought in the U.S. seven hundred ml, fifteen. Glenn Alec fifteen, and uh, Jack White is drinking a Glenn Mori. So Glen Murray Distillery, I think it's one isn't really talked much about. Um, Jason Whiskey Wise has done a number of different videos on Glen Murray. However, he doesn't post videos that much these days. Um, but uh, if you want to see more videos on Glen Murray, you might want to check him out. Jason Whiskey Wise, he works in the industry. So I know that kind of, I think, was cutting into his time that he had for doing uh, videos. So uh, if you're watching this on the replay or you haven't tuned in for this live series i'm doing a series in studying for the uh, certified whiskey specialist exam with the council of whiskey masters part of the study is doing uh, um, distillery profiles so that's so i'm doing a video on a particular just bottle from a particular distillery and then the lid on that saturday going live have a little, short little uh, quiz based on the content of that video um and we'll also be doing a little bit on production as well um I'll, I'll probably do a whole separate video on production but we also have a video tonight by glenn maury on, on production so i did a review of this glenn Mori 18 this is an absolutely spectacular uh whiskey if you didn't watch the video you're going to want to go back and watch this you know if you're going to study whiskey or wines you, you want to understand what is a classic, say, Napa Valley Cabernet? What is a classic uh, Riesling from the Mosul? What is a classic Isla Peated Whiskey? What is a classic Kentucky Bourbon? You know, one that sort of typifies that particular style of wine or whiskey when you're studying for exams. You want to get to know what is a 100%, you know, Old Rose of Sherry cask-like, you know, first fill show, uh, Old Rose of Sherry. What's a second fill? Uh, Oloroso Sherry cask like what is a 100% in this case bourbon cask first fill bourbon cask and so I've been thinking more more lately in terms of blind tasting and getting to understand whiskeys I need to perhaps put together a little sample bottles here is a perfect example of you know a second fill sherry here's a first fill of sherry um, the next video <coughs> excuse me the next video we're going to be doing, or distillery we're going to be looking at, is going to be um, Glen Goyne, and I'll be reviewing the Glen Goyne cask strength. The Glen Goyne cask strength, fantastic whiskey, by the way. If you can get a bottle, I highly recommend it. It's probably going to, it's probably going to be in my top ten within my top ten uh, for this year. It is done with uh, um, sec, I think first fill, but I think more, more second fill and bourbon cask. So essentially, in using second fill uh, uh, Oloroso Sherry Cast, they're pulling back on the intensity of the dried black fruit notes. And then using combination with a bourbon cask, it really comes across very, very, very different. In fact, when I was first tasting it, it actually reminded me of um, Fino Cast from like Tomatin or Tobomori, the Fino Cask. Because if you and if you watch my series on uh, sherried whiskeys, you know a fino uh, is done um, with a age with a floor, this yeast film over it, which prevents it from more of the intensive oxidative uh, aging as in one oloroso, and so the oxidative character isn't as intense with a fino, and then as say with an oloroso, and in between those would be like an amontillado. So in using second fill sherry cask and then using a bourbon cask you are pulling back on the intensity of a, 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 an oloroso sherry cask and the consequence is it starts to come across more like a fino all right and i'll get more into that when i re review that whiskey mark slinger thanks for uh, tuning in mark didn't we meet at glen Mori distillery i think we i think we did <laughs> Let me remind me, Mark, remind me. I think Mark Slinger and I met, if I recall correctly, uh, at Glen Maury Distillery, which is kind of funny. Uh, Taste and Sensibility, uh, good evening. He says he's sipping on, yes, we did. Okay, I thought so. I thought so. 
so in 2019 when I was touring and he was, you know, tracking me as to where I was going, uh, not stalking me, but you know, from my post on Facebook or whatever. The, and so uh, we ended up meeting up at Glen Murray Distillery. And so here we are again, meeting up again, uh, talking about uh, Glen Murray. That's cool. All right. You know, so this is an absolutely fantastic whiskey. I think I paid like 114 And if I was going to study for exam or someone else, I'd go, hey, what is a good first fill bourbon cask, you know, to sort of tune that into your head as to what that's like? Boom. This is it. Uh, I think it's also a high quality price uh, ratio whiskey. Um, I think the mouthfeel is perfect. I I think it's an absolutely superb whiskey. Now, this is a bottle. Oh, I have over here. Uh, and I've already reviewed this when I did my video on my tour of Glen Murray. This is one I picked up at the distillery. This is a uh, PX Peated. PX Peated. This was a distillery exclusive. This is, I believe, it was a 2010 PX Peated. They do have in their core range a, a peated cask, but this is the PX peated cask. I'm going to return to this a little bit uh, tonight. All righty. Yeah, I remember we met up there at, at the cafe after I did my tour. And uh, one of the things I enjoyed about it is they, uh, you can get a bite to eat there at the cafe, but they also had whiskey ice cream. I had to try the whiskey ice cream, uh, which was really, really good. It's not like the Hagen dazs where, Hagen dazs does a like a bourbon ice cream that's barely. It sort of resembles a whiskey, but not really. All righty, so let's get into the quiz. We only have eight quiz questions, and then I'm gonna show you a video on production. I'm probably gonna create my own separate video on production, uh, hitting on the main points of production because that's gonna be on the exam. So that'll be coming up in the near future. Again, uh, I said before the purpose of the quiz is to reinforce what we've already what I've already covered in the previous video and only eight questions usually have 10 questions uh, so all right here we go Glen Murray distillery is located near a the river Spey B the river Lossie C the Loch Ness or D the river Tay where is the what is Glenmore Distillery located near? It's one of these four. One of these four. There is a River Tay in the area. There's a River Lossie in the area. And the River Spay is probably not too, not too far away. I don't think the Loch Ness is anywhere near there. Sorry if I give a spoiler on that one. Um, the Loch Ness is over in Inverness. All right. Mark Binger. Uh, yeah. Mark Slinger says B. Taste and sensibility says A. And the answer is, oops, crap. I went to the wrong question. Damn it. What the heck happened? Where is the, you know what? The answer thing moved when I uploaded it. Where in the hell did it go? Son of a gun. I upload, when I uploaded the slides, where in the hell is it? Oh, sorry. I'm going to have to tell you what it is. It's a River Lossie. It's River Lossie. The slide is missing. I uploaded all the slides, and now it's missing. What the hell, man? Let me look, see if it... So when I, I uploaded all the slides, it jumbled them, and I had to go back and manually move them around. And now it seems the answer for quiz one is missing. Oh, well. Anyway, the answer is uh, B. The River Lossie, the River Lossie. There's also a Lossie Distillery, Glen Lossie Distillery, by the way. Um, never had anything from there. All right, number two. Glen Murray Distillery originally was A, Elgin Abattoir. If you don't know what Abattoir is, Abattoir is uh, where they process dead cattle. Um, so it was either Glen Murray, it was originally it was Elgin Abattoir. Or B, Elgin West Brewery, C, Elgin Cotton Mill, or D, Elgin Dairy Farm, or Elgin Dairy Farm. Uh, Mark says B, Too Slow says B. So what, it was an abattoir where they processed dead cattle. They got a lot of cattle in the Highlands and, and Speyside. Was it a brewery? Was it a cotton mill? And was it a, or a dairy farm? 
Jack White says, C, a cotton mill, a cotton mill. I can tell who's watching my videos and paying attention and who isn't. <laughs> and the answer is B, a brewery, a brewery. So there was a distillery that was a cotton mill. Uh, if I recall correctly, that would be Deanston, Deanston. Um, oops, sorry. A dairy farm. I don't know of any Scottish distillers that were dairy farms. But it's Elgin Brewery. Answer is Elgin Brewery. All right. I'm going to pour myself something here. Just a little bit. It's a little warm here today. It's a nice spring day. Probably about 70 degrees. I went up for a little walk earlier around the golf course. Get some sunshine. Mm. Mm. Wow. So in my review of this, I said it reminds me of a California Chardonnay. You can do, you can age Chardonnay and just stay in the steel. So it has no oak influence. And it'll come across as very sharp, very austere, and mostly just sort of an apple character. You can do a Chardonnay in neutral oak, as they do in Chablis. Um, and it'll, you don't have a lot of the vanilla, cinnamons, and the baking spices. But in, in neutral oak, it'll sort of soften the edges of the, in the mouthfeel of the wine. And still, it's more of a crisp app, apple and pear. When you start introducing new oak, then you're getting oak spices, vanilla, cinnamon, nutmeg, baking spices. So you can go stainless steel, neutral oak, new oak, or you could do some part-time in new oak and some in um, previously used oak. So you can kind of dial in how much oak influence you want on your Chardonnay. Then there's something called malolactic conversion or malolactic fermentation. Um in which you're converting uh, the acids in the in the wine into lactic acid, like milk. And that gives you your buttery characteristic uh, creaminess to it. You can then, if you wanted to, you could actually age a Chardonnay in a cask. Uh, uh, excuse me, distill in a distill. Ferment in a cask and then age in a cask. So then it's like just heavy over, heavy, 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 heavy influence of uh the cask of, of the wood of the oak on the chardonnay uh, and they're very much like it's basically like a baked apple pie just loads of spice they tend to be darker in color and that's what this whiskey reminds me of it's like a a, a barrel fermented barrel aged chardonnay obviously with a heck of a lot more alcohol uh, but it's that heavy influence of the oak um, so, well, why doesn't it remind me of, um, a bourbon since this is aged in, um, a first of all bourbon cask, because it doesn't have the corn characteristic of a bourbon. So if, if you were, of course, there's, there is a little bit of a maltiness on this as well, but if you were being blinded on this with a bourbon, you know, first filled malt, first filled cask, bourbon cask versus a bourbon this doesn't have the, any corn characteristics it's that malt characteristic so it has the oak character of a bourbon so it ha it's a lot of the descriptors would be very similar to describing a bourbon except it doesn't have that caramel corn character to it um but it does have but you can have bourbons that have apple character as well the apple pie character as well but that's the way it comes across uh take away the corn put in a little a malt character and that comes across uh just like this mm -mm 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 -mm. super rich I mean, rich 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 christopher Molloy, thanks for turning in he says i see fewer and fewer let me put that he says i see fewer and fewer glenmore elgin classics around these days i'm seeing fewer and fewer of a lot of things these days um, I have to do most of my buying online 
and contact people I know uh, who can go straight to the distributor and buy from them. I just ordered a whiskey through a friend who owns a shop um, and he went to his distributor and then got me a bottle. That's how I had to, had, had to go about it. Um, so if you want to build a collection or something like that and really um, get involved uh, or really develop a collection, be buying, you know, building up a collection like this, you have to get to know people in some way, even if they're, it's not necessarily that they're giving you some things for free or anything like that, but just that they have the resources, they have the accesses, they can track things down for you. But um, if you are looking for things, Wine Searcher, even though it's called a Wine Searcher, there's a Wine Searcher search engine, check that for uh, buying stuff. So sometimes I buy things from um, them as well. All righty, next question. Question number three. Glenn Morey, Glenn Livet Distillery. So there are actually there are ten. If you remember, go back to the Glenn Livet uh, video uh, when Glenn Livet was founded. Other distilleries started using the name Glenn Livet, and then they fought it in court, and they sort of won, sort of didn't win. The, and the end result was only one distillery could call itself the Glenn Livet, but ten others were allowed to hyphenate their name with Glenn Livet. And so uh, McAllen is one of those. Abelauer is another. Well, Glenn Morey was one of the 10 that can use the name Glenn Livet. All right. So Glenn Morey, Glenn Livet Distillery was founded in 1824. B, 1846. C, 1897. Or D, 1910. Or B, 1910. I think probably the most challenging thing is remembering dates because they're a bit abstract. So unless there's something else to tie it into, um, so the Excise Act of 1823 was the year that uh, licensed distillation became legal in Scotland. So if you can remember, that what I'm doing is, if you can remember how long after that the distillery was founded, that will help you sort of uh, tie it in there. So Taste and Sensibility says B. Uh, Jack White says C. Mark Singer says B. Too Slow says EB. Chris McClure says B. And the answer is 1897. 1897. The answer was C. 1897. 1897. One of the things that's going to get confusing, um, I, so I'm, I've I've prepared all the notes and everything in the video parts for um, Glenn Goyne. I'm just now wrapping up, just before we went live, wrapping up working on the slides for um, Glendronic. Uh, there's a lot of the same names you see over and over and over and over again, um, particularly the Grants, Smiths, Grants, Georges, James, and Johns. That's probably one of the other most confusing things to try to keep some of these names straight. Uh, name straight. Um, one of the sons of William Grant started Glendronic, uh, or at, at one point bought Glendronic. He owned Glendronic, so he didn't start Glendronic. James Allardyce and a bunch of others um, are credited with st starting Glendronic, uh, but at one point, uh, one of the sons of William Grant uh, owned uh, Glendronic. All righty, next question. In 1910, Glen Morey's sister distillery burned down. Glen Morey subsequently closed. Did I just screw up? In 1910, yes. No, I, I, I hope I didn't just screw that up. I think I just told you the answer, but I'm not sure. I'm a little tired. In 1910, Glen Morey's sister distillery, what's the name of the sister distillery, burned down. Glenn Morey subsequently uh, closed. Did I, I did I just give the answer? I don't know. I'm a little tired. So, uh, what happens? So, 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 so Abelar. Oh shit! I just gave the answer. Son of a bitch! I, I knew I was going to do that. 
The answer is Aberlauer. <laughs> Aberlauer. So the owners of uh, Glen Mori, Glen Aberlauer caught fire, which is when I toured there, they would not let you take photos with your cell phone while they're in production. Um, it was very difficult to get pic pictures of Aberlauer, Aberlauer Distillery. So they were paying so much attention to Abelard that they sort of neglected Glen Mori and consequently Glen Mori um, ended up closing. Glen Dronic, Glen Dronic, which is which will be a couple of weeks away, one of the most challenging, one of the most difficult, one of the most confusing histories. Uh, chain, that distillery has changed hands and opened and closed and burned down. Um, one of the most dramatic and complicated histories out of every distillery I've ever uh, studied. But we'll get into that in a couple of weeks. So, Abelard. Hmm. Of course, the company that owns Glenlivet now owns Abelard, and that's Bernard Ricard. So, distillers changing hands, opening and closing, changing names, which is nice to have at least Glen Farkless and Glenlivet that have stayed in the family. Number Six. In 1958, Glen Mori Distillery replaced their floor malting with A, an industrial malt house, B, a salad in box, C, malt from Port Ellen, or D, drum malting. So, in 1958, Glen Mori Distillery replaced their floor malting with what? They started using an, adult, uh, an industrial malt house. They started using a salad in box. Uh, C, malt from Port Ellen. Or D, drum malting. Which is it? Some of you might be wondering, what the heck is a salad in box? Now, it is very common. Of course, a lot of distilleries, even if they have their own malting floor, can't do enough to... Um, cover their needs for their production, so they still source. Uh, Kilholman, for example, you know they have some that they do for themselves, um, as does. Um, do my brain to work. Lafroig, Lafroig, and Beaumore uh, have malting floors as well, but they, they can't produce enough. David Belcher, thanks for tuning in, man. No one's late. All right, so what's the answer? Da, 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 da. B, a salad in box. A salad in box. So you're wondering, what the heck is a salad in box? All right, so I'll take it off picture and I'll explain it. In... Oops. Um... So what's a salad in box? One of the challenges of doing floor malting um, is, okay, for those who don't know what malting is, uh, Whereas brandy already has sugar in it. Sugar cane for making rum already has sugar in it. All right. So brandy made from wine, rum made from cane sugar already has sugar in it. For whiskeys, you have to convert a starch into sugar. Uh, in order to convert, uh, convert a starch into sugar, you do malting. In Canada, they introduce an enzyme. You basically get it moist. A little bit of humidity. The plant thinks it's time to grow. It's going to create a new plant. So it starts to grow. It starts to sprout. You didn't need to stop it because you don't want it to absorb all, can convert. You don't want it to absorb and eat all the starch on the inside because it's using it as a source of food in order to grow, right? Source of energy. So you basically use a kiln to stop the production of it. Um, so that there's still a remnant of, of starch that's been converted into sugar. And that sugar is then going to be turned into alcohol, simply put. Uh, the problem is, is when you have a molting floor and you have all this barley is, the little uh, sprouts, the little shoots, the little roots that are spread, uh, sticking out tend to get, when you have you know a whole mat in of them, they tend to get intertwined with each other. And that's the reason why you've probably seen uh, photos or video of some guy with a with a fork flipping them over like this, 
those who have, you know, it's that's the old way of doing it. And of course, that's where Monkey Shoulder gets his name because guys who would spend all day flipping the barley over, you know, they get this soreness in the shoulder, uh, the kind of slumped sh- sh- shoulder. Reality, those who still using malting floors uh, are using um, a machine. It's kind of looks like a, a lawnmower. Basically, they run over the malt that then flips it over, you know, brr, you know, flips it over to keep the roots from getting intertangled. So a salad in box is a long box about it's about 50 feet long and it has a corkscrew in it that's turning it over. So what it's doing is rather than someone turning over uh, the barley by hand or with a machine, a salad in box using this sort of corkscrew uh, is going like this and it's breaking up the roots. So Glenn Morey had a salad in box. They don't use it anymore. Glenn Morey had a salad in box for about two decades in which they were using those. There's still, there's only one distillery that I think still uses it, a salad in box. And off the top of my mind, I, 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 at the top of my head, I can't remember who it is. Uh, if somebody who knows, can remember who still uses a salad in a box, I'll make a comment uh, down below. All righty. Yeah, Highland Park has a malting floor as well. Um, Springbank also has a malting floor. Right. There are eight distilleries, basically, that still have a malting floor. Um, next question. Number seven. The current owner of Glen Morey Distillery is A. Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, also known as LVMH. B. And forgive my pronunciation if it is, it's not uh, French enough. Uh, B. Le Martin Quisse Bardinet, C. Pernod Ricard, or D. Diageo. Who is the current owner of Glen Mori? Mark Binger says B. David Belcher says B. Jack White says B. So, so far we got a uh, d- dirty d- dog says A, LVMH. All righty. So the answer is B. And my pronunciation is probably a bit off. Le Martin Quise Bardinet. Sorry, my French isn't all that great. Now, LVMH or Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, they own. Uh, Glenn Morangy, and they own Ardbeg. LVMH, I got a bug flying around here. They own uh, Glenn Morangy, and they own uh, Ardbeg. This Le Martin Quise Bidet, whatever how they even pronounce that. I don't know of any other distilleries that they own um, in Scotland, but I'm sure there might be others. All right, question. Last question. Last question. In 2019, Glenn Mori Distillery introduced a blank cask whiskey. In 2019, Glenn Murray Distiller introduced a blank cask whiskey. A, Mezcal. B, Tequila. C, Madeira. Or D, Rum Agricole. So in, I think it was June 2019, Mezcal became, and Tequila became, uh, at least Mezcal did, became legal. So did they jump on the bandwagon and release a Mezcal cask? Or did they do a Madeira or a Rum Agricole? Rum Agricole. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Christopher Malloy. Yeah, Tandu. You know, I had the I had a name with a T in my head. I uh, couldn't remember if it was Tina Dick. Um, Tandu. All right. Still has a salad in the box. Mark Dinger says D, rum agricole. David Belcher says D, I think. Jack White says C, Madeira. And the answer is rum agricole. In fact, it's from uh, a rum producer that's owned by the same company. Uh, That's owned by the same company. 
All right, so that's it for the quizzes, and we are at right about 5.30. So uh, I want to share a video on production. One of the things, when you go and you visit distilleries, is the video clip still there? What the hell, man? No, it's still there. Okay. So when you visit distilleries, some people say if you visit one distillery, you've seen them all because you kind of hear the same thing over and over and over again. You hear the story about the Bobby Mill and all this kind of stuff, and some people think, that um, that they, they become boring. And I think people who perhaps live in Scotland are probably less likely to be as enthused about visiting distilleries as people who are coming from outside the country because that's something in their own backyard. Uh, for me, you know, I've, I moved here to the Sonoma wine country uh, in July last year. I've not visited any winery since I've been here. I left three wineries right down the road. I have, I've been to them like years ago, but I haven't been to any of them. There's something about if you're in the neighborhood, you just don't feel like you need to run out and go visit that winery or that distillery. So I've heard when I was in Scotland, some people say, yeah, 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 yeah. They're not. Whereas an American flying across to the other side of the country, uh, it's much more of a unique experience um, to an exciting and a journey and exploration and all that. But if you think they're all the same, then you must also think that all the whiskeys are the same, and which, of course, we know isn't true. And it's in paying attention to the little details um, during a tour and asking questions. You don't want to be annoying. <laughs> you don't want to be annoying. But, yeah, while there are some basics that are common to all distilleries, which is what would be on an exam, there are some differences, whether it's the size of the stills whether it's the fermentation time, of course, the water source, everybody likes to make a big deal about water source, uh, whether um, what kind of barley they're using, uh, you know, what strain of barley they're using, it's, or whether they're using worm tubs or not. Uh, it's those little tiny little details um, th that collectively make up the differences and, and the un un uniqueness that uniqueness of the whiskeys of that distillery. And so if things, if you're visiting a distillery and things seem too much like a run of the bell, like every other distillery, start asking questions. Um, and there you're gonna find out whether you have a really good tour guide or not. Drinking age, I believe in Scotland is like 18 years old. So um, the result is you can get some young people, 18, 19 years old, it's their first job. You know, they got the job because, you know, whatever it's in the neighborhood. It's, it's what the economy is about. But you have people, people who their family has been in the, in the business for generations. And so even if they're young, they still know a lot about production. And you can tell the difference between someone who is just reading a script, just memorize a script. Okay. You know, when you're doing a tour, this is what you say. And they kind of give, tell them what to, what to tell all the, all the visitors. Versus people who really, really, really know, really, really enthusiastic uh, and can really dive deep in answering a lot of great questions. When I went to Glen Livet Distillery, it was one of the best tours. I think the whiskeys are okay. I like the whiskeys. They're okay. But I thought it was actually one of the best tour guides because the guy, his family's been there for several generations. When you go to Isla, uh, a lot of the people working in the distilleries, they have you know their aunts and uncles and cousins and parents and grandparents and whatever are working in the distillery. So it's sort of in their blood. And uh, so some of the best distilleries in which you can ask a lot of great questions. And sometimes they'll say, when you start asking a lot of really good questions, they'll actually do something a little different than the, and they'll break from the script uh, uh, that they've been they maybe given and maybe go a little bit deeper into stuff. So uh, always ask, of course, I can be a little annoying when asking of questions, but um, ask questions. Grumpy Old Fart says, good evening, everyone. And McKellen, I felt like my tour leader was reading a script. I had the Whiskey Rev, who was very, very, very knowledgeable. Um, he, and he's a friend of Roy, Aquavite's. So, it, yeah, that would not surprise me. Uh, when... If you have, this is our image. This is our company image. This is 
what we want you to project and you not to deviate from that. Um, when I was living down in the Silicon Valley, I talked to uh, a rep, but he was also a managing rep um, for LVMH. Uh, and so I met him. He was from Scotland, but he lived in, in uh, San Jose. So he had a Scottish accent, but you could tell he'd been in the United States for a little while. And I asked him, say, hey, I'd like, hey, you want to come on my channel? I'd like to have you on my channel. And he said somebody, one of the other reps had gone onto a YouTube channel. And I guess he sort of deviated from the script. And so they kind of put a hamper on that. And that's the reason why you don't see me, I don't, you don't see me having reps on. Because it just turns into an infomercial. And I'm not into that. I'm not, I'm not into that. Um, Mark Slinger says, yeah, he says he loves the Glenn Fittich tour. Yeah, I really, really liked it. Um, <laughs> I'm ready for Eric Waite Scotch tours. You know, it'd be fun, but who wants to? Why would you want to listen to an American over in Scotland when you can listen to a Scotsman? And they have the accent. No one's ever going to hire me to be a tour guide at a Scotch distillery. It'd be very, very weird. Uh, or you know, I. When, even when I went to Kentucky and visited distilleries in Kentucky, I wanted to hear a Kentucky accent. Um, and some of them do. Of course, some could always fake an accent, but I liked hearing the Kentucky accent um, when I visited distilleries. Alrighty, so that's the end of our quiz. Hope everyone uh, did well. If not, go back and watch the video again. If you haven't watched it, go watch it. So let's, uh, I want to show you a little bit of a uh, a video on production. This won't be the first time or last time. Um, well, it is the first time in this series that I'm doing a, a showing a video on uh, production because um, it's going to be part of a quiz. So, in, part of reading, part of learning. So, in case you haven't seen one of these videos, the textbook for this course is uh, "The World Atlas of Whiskey" by Dave uh, Broom. And I said this before; it's more of a coffee table book than it is uh, a textbook. It, I mean, the, the section on Glenn Murray is like one page. Uh, my videos go far and more in depth than these do, than this book does. Um, keep it from falling off the table here. <clears throat> so reading the books, I underline the books, make flashcards, take notes, doing videos. Um, but also repetition. These are various ways in which to reinforce the information uh, so, so pre for preparation for exam. So I will do a multitude or, or at least a bunch on production. All right, uh, here we go. Whiskey is the generic name for a distilled product made from fermented cereal extracts as malted barley or other grains, which is then aged in oak casks for a period of time. For Scotch whiskey, the minimum length of maturation is three years. Whiskey is produced from only three ingredients, water, yeast, and grains. From the very beginning, the type of cereals defines the type of whiskey, whether it's barley, wheat, corn, or even rice. Glenmurray whiskey is a single malt whiskey. This means that it is made just with malted barley and produced in one single distillery. On the opposite, there are blended whiskies. They are made from various fermented cereals, barley, wheat, corn or rice, and from different distilleries. The four Scottish regions creating distinct styles of whisky are the West Highlands, including Isla, which produce a full, smoky and salty style whisky. The Lowlands are famous for creating light and citrus whiskies. The Highlands create a floral and aromatic whisky, whereas Speyside are known for creating whiskies which are rich, fruity and sweet. The barley is steeped in water to start the germination process. Once it has absorbed enough moisture, it is then laid out to continue germinating. The barley is now referred to as green malt, 
and is transferred to a kiln where it's dried to stop the germination process. At this point, peat smoke can be introduced to create a whisky with smoky characteristics. This is then ground up in the mill where it's turned into grist. The grist is then transferred into a large mash tun where it's mixed with hot water at about 64 degrees centigrade. The starch is converted to sugar, dissolved in the water and what we extract now is called sweet wort. The sweet wort is transferred to one of the washbacks and turned into alcohol by the addition of yeast. The yeast also creates fruity and floral compounds such as esters. After two days, the alcohol reaches a concentration of around 8.5% alcohol by volume. This is called wash. The wash is now boiled up twice in copper stills. The copper helps to create certain flavours and remove unwanted compounds. The first is called the wash still, and the second distillation takes place in a spirit still. The spirit travels through the spirit safe, where the purest part, or the cut, is taken and then redistilled. What we now have is new make spirit. The new make spirit is transferred to casks, which have usually been used previously to mature either bourbon or sherry and have been specially prepared by our coopers. Once the casks are filled, they are rolled into the warehouse. They then lie for many years, allowing the whisky to slowly mature and grow in complexity and in depth of flavour. The transformation here is gradual, but the resulting difference in colour, aroma and taste can be quite dramatic. All right, so a couple things about the video. Um, one, he mentions rice. You know, there are a few Japanese whiskeys that will use rice um, and import here, but I was surprised he didn't mention rye. Rye is a lot more common than rice, particularly here in the United States. So why they said rice and didn't even mention uh, rye, I thought was a little odd. Now, of course, this is a, an oversimplified understanding of production. There are more details. Didn't talk about condensers. Didn't talk about reflux. Didn't talk about uh, the, the length and size of the still. He didn't talk about the role of copper uh, in the still, the importance of copper in the still. You know, there's, there's a lot of, it didn't talk about, you know, um, four shots, hearts, and tails. And, and in uh, the spirit safe, so there's so that's an oversimplified uh, look at production, and so when I do another video in the future, it'll be a lot more in depth, a lot more in depth uh, I look at production. So, but anyway, I thought it was, but that's kind of like it was more of the typical thing you're going to run at a distillery, because the average person visiting a distillery, they yeah they like whiskey or hey that's in Scotland. Let's go to a distillery. It's like being California. Hey, we're in California. Let's go visit a winery. But they're not necessarily like real wine enthusiasts. It's just something fun to do. So I think probably the majority of people who are vi the tourism of visiting distilleries, if you put too much information in, you're going to lose them. They're, they're, they're like, was I supposed to take, is there going to be a quiz later on? Is there a test on this? You know, there's just too much information. So that's much more of an introductory uh look at production but we'll get more into it uh later on all right lynn maury 2010 bottled at 55.8 percent abv now a lot of glenn maury's that are they're actually in, in maybe in the high 20s low 30s they also tend to be 40 percent abv but uh, and a lot of wine cash so a lot of the flavor is coming from the wine cask so they have chandon blanc cabernet uh sauvignon chardonnay uh, and of course uh, rum agricole um, so you're really going to get a lot of the flavor coming from those casks which sort of maybe in some sense makes up for the lack of abv 
and and being uh, leaning on the ABV to give it more of the punch of flavor. Now you visit the distillery, you can get more close to something closer to cash strength. Again, uh, 55.8% alcohol by volume. This is peated and PX. Now, P uh, Peter Jimenez PX is already a very dense and concentrated flavor. Uh, Pedro Jimenez PX is a grape type. All the other types of sherry are made from uh, the Palomino grape. The difference then between Fino, Amontillado, uh, uh, and uh, Oloroso, or uh, Palo Cantado has to do with whether it's uh, biological or oxidative aging, whether or not, so whether or not there's that floor or not, uh, and so forth. And that that's what makes the differences between the different other types of sherry. Whereas Peter Jimenez is made from a distinctly um, um, Peter Jimenez grape. It's also done on different soils. Uh, those other Palomino's is grown on uh, Albariza soil. Excuse me, I'm burping here. Old man, or white, oh, chalky Albariza soil. Peter Jimenez, the grapes themselves are also laid out on mats to raisin, almost become, uh, to, yeah, to dry up and become like raisins. So you're looking at a really, really simple, I mean, PX, they call it a sherry, but a lot of it actually comes from um, the Morales region, uh, uh, further east outside the Sherry Triangle. Um, also comes from other areas of Andalusia. So even though they call it a sherry, it's, most of the time it's actually not from uh, Jerez. So it's a very dense and concentrated, dry, 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 dark black fruit notes. Now you're adding to that, let me bring the comments back up. Now you're adding to that peat. So I have another peated PX cask whiskey here. This is, of course, the, uh, how the heck do I get this thing out of here? Anyway. This is Ardbeg and O. This is a special edition. It came in like this little barbecue, barbecue thing. I bought it because of novelty. Now I'm actually going to plan on trying to barbecue. Son of a gun. Oh, that's great. I got another one sitting over here. Hard big. And oh, there we go. So Ardbeg and oh, another peated PX cask whiskey. So if you can't get the Glen Mori PX peated and you want something similar, 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 I'm in trouble talking today. Uh, check out the um, Ardbeg. N-O or N-O or, or however the hell they want to pronounce it. All righty. Be so being a sticky, sort of a sticky wine, anything you're going to put into a PX cask, it's sort of going to sort of cling to it. So you could have two whiskeys at the same uh, PPM level, but when you put it into the uh, same spirit at the same PPM level, but when you put it into a PX cask, there's a sense in which that PX cast is going to absorb a lot of the peak character in, during the aging process. And so it's not going to come across as smoky and, and, and peaty as would, a, uh, say, a bourbon cask or, or some other type of cask. Also, you're talking about a dark, dark, rich prune raisin flavored wine and then combined with a dark smoky character you talk about darkness on top of darkness you're talking about you know a density on top of a density and that's what it comes across dried black fruit notes raisins plums chocolate all freaking day long loads and loads of chocolate the peat and the smoke is really interwoven really, really, really well. It's very dense. This has actually opened up quite a bit since I recently opened it. Um, 
back in 2019. You know what? I'm going to get another glass. Let's do a head-to-head -head with this Glory, uh, Glenn Murray over here. Let's do a head-to-head. -head. I wasn't planning this. Do a Glenn Murray. Eric, uh, where is the world other than the distillery? Did you get that? Where, where in the world other than the distillery did you get that? The only place I know you can get that is from the distillery. Sorry. I They do, in the core range, they do have a, a peated whiskey, but I don't think it's a peated PX. So other than that, you would have to sort of shop around you or Google it. I'm sure there's people who buy these whiskeys from the distillery and then, you know, flip them. But other than that, I, I don't know. I don't think they did distribute it. But I'm kind of curious. How does the NO compare? It's going to be lower in ABV. That I do know. Color-wise, I can already see the NO is lighter. So NO is 40, I think 46. Um, 46.6. Don't know where the peak comes from, from for Glen Mori. NO obviously doesn't have as much. The ABV is not as high. We don't know what the age is on either one of them. But immediately the NO comes across as a little younger. Color is lighter. That's a lot. I mean, look at that. That's freaking dark. That's a lot darker. And yet there's some similarities. Uh, I'm getting a little bit more of an oceanic influence on the NO, a little more of the saltiness on the NO. But similar in terms of a smoke, but not in terms of the PX influence. The Glen Murray, it seems a lot more like a dark chocolate. At its core, the N.O. is still showing, I would say, classic art bed characteristics, that lemon and lime character. On the back end, I think the PX starts showing up. So I don't think the N.O. is 100% PX cask. I think they are using some bourbon cask and then putting some time. I'm just, someone could correct me and look at, look at that. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's the way it comes across is it spent some time in bourbon cask and then PX cask. I don't think it's, I think maybe finished in PX. I don't think it was aged hundred percent in PX. Whereas in comparison, The, the Glen Murray is so much richer, so much darker, so much more dense. It's actually a little spicier, too, on the back end and richer. I can say the Glen Murray is showing better now than when I originally had it. Or at least from my memory. There's a little bit of mint, chocolate mint. Uh, York's peppermint patty that shows up on, on the back end. Really, really nice. Yeah, hands down, the Glen Murray totally blows away the N.O., Obviously, the NO is a lot easier to get, but they're still, but they're still uh, on the NO on the back end. There is still you still do do pick up some of that. I'm having trouble talking today. I'm tired. I, I worked like sixty hours this week. Um, I have I'm working tomorrow, and I'll be working another 55, 60, 60 hours this next week. I've been doing this since July. I've had only four days off. I'll turn to regular PTO vacation time since last July. Um, and I work a lot, work a lot of weekends. It's just, I get a little tired. Um, what's your opinion on clear glass versus colored glass bottles? Interesting. W one or the other, I don't particularly care. Uh, if I, if I was going to sell whiskey, and I, I didn't want to use E150. I might go with the green glass just so that the numbskulls who think color is important, it would get rid of that issue. 
in terms of you know if if i mean i don't have my whiskeys in direct sunlight to begin with but if you want to protect your whiskey a green glass is going to do better than a clear glass so uh personally if i was you know i want to go uh no e150 which i would i would never want to use e150 and i wanted to make a whiskey that you know if potentially someone was going to have in sunlight I would go with the green glass, uh, but as in terms of a personal preference, I don't particularly care. Uh, I don't pay that much attention to the color in terms of whether I'm going to buy something or not. I pay attention to it when I'm analyzing it, when I'm looking at it and evaluating and thinking about it, but uh, so to some, uh, but not in terms of whether I'm going to buy it or not. So anyway, so I, it doesn't really matter. I think it's a smart thing to put it in um, a, a green uh, glass. I t because Ardbeg is a lot of times has that lemon lime character. I tend to equate that lemon and lime character with a green bottle. <laughs> and that's silly, but um, you just I just didn't make the associations. And the fact that it's, it's very oceanic, you think of seaweed, and you think of the oceanic character. I associate that with green. You know, I think of the Kelpie uh, release, right? Uh, I just start making those associations. So, but other than that, if you want, if you want to show off the color and that you're not using E150, yeah, if you want to make a case of it, you know, hey, let's show them the the, the darkness of the color. Um, then I can see why people would want to go with a clear glass. But both of these whiskeys come in a box, so they sit in a box on my shelf anyway. So I'm not really worried about uh, the the sunlight. One of the things kind of interesting that I like about Glenmorey's bottle. Look at the shape of it. The bottle is the shape of a still. Whereas, I mean, the Glen Mori kind of is, you know, the way it bulbs out, you know, this is that kind of like the reflux bulb uh, on a bottle. But I think the Glen Mori is much more like uh, the shape of their still uh, than um, Ardbeg is, which makes me wonder, where is Old Pultney? Old Pultney. Here's Old Pultney 15. I think, I was just thinking Glenn Moore bottle reminds me of Old Pultney bottle. No, but, oh, check, so here's, check, just looking at bottles. Uh, so Old Pultney's bottles look like they're just, it has that same, that similar bulbous character there, but there's an extra reflux bulb uh, in, in the Old Pultney uh, bottle. Um, anyhow. I think it's kind of cool to have a bottle that looks like one of your stills. Um, you know, if you're thinking of a design and having something that sort of fits uh, the imagery of your whiskey, just to have bottles that look like your stills. I think it's kind of cool. Versus, you know, here's a Glenn Grant, just a standard, some sort of standard uh, bottle. Now, you wouldn't want Glenn Morangy making their bottles like the stills because it'd be too damn tall, right? Because they're them, them tallest uh, stands. I mean, tall, tall ass. God, I am, I'm difficult to talk to today. Those tall ass uh, stills. Should have taken a nap before going live. Fantastic. All right. So, mentioned it before. I re just moved everything on my shelf, so now I'm a little confused. Oh, here it is. So my next video, I'm going to be doing the Glen Goyne. This is the Glen Goyne Cast Strength Unchill Filtered Natural Color. And this is release number, because I think they have different releases. Hold on. Is that 59.2% alcohol by volume? Batch number, really hard to read. Damn. Batch number eight. Batch number eight. I'll be reviewing this next. Uh, amazing freaking whiskey. If you can get a Glen Goyne, cast strength, number eight. Now, it's a non age statement, but I don't give a hoot. This is an absolute killer whiskey. So I'm just giving you a heads up. My review will be out. Uh, later this next this next week, 
an absolutely superb, superb, superb whiskey. It's one of those that I think of as dangerously delicious. The main issue, I could Scott and Bart over at Scott's Test Dummies reviewed this. It, it can be real easy to, when you think of sherry cask, you have a certain preset image in your head as to what to expect from a sherry cask. And if you're thinking, you know, like a like a Glendronic or um, Abelar, Abudna, or you think of those dark, dark, dark uh, fruit, dried black fruit notes, it's not that way at all. And so if you have preset in your mind that what you're expecting and it doesn't meet your expectations, then you're going to be uh, disappointed or because it's not the, yeah, at a cast drink, it's not the sherry bomb that you think it is, but it's an absolutely fantastic uh, whiskey. You need to try Glen Breton. I've tried, so I've tried Glen Breton. Glen Breton is a Canadian whiskey over in uh, Nova Scotia. I've never had a bottle. I've never seen a bottle here. I tried it over in the vault uh, down in Texas. So I've tried it in it was okay. I wasn't I wasn't wild by it. I'd like to get a bottle it, just for the novelty of nothing else. Um, so, alrighty, uh, right at the top of the hour, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. If you're watching on the replay, thank you very much for uh, watching. Give this video a thumbs up. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, uh, leave them down below. And for those who are watching after this video. Um, processes takes about 24 hours to process. I will put over here, over here somewhere. I will put links to other videos in this series that you should watch after watching this. All right. Hope everyone enjoys the rest of the weekend. And until next time, cheers. <laughs>